morning. Thank you for coming to our Fall 2017 Grace A. Tanner Lecture in Human Values. I am Dr. Danielle Dabrowski, Director of the Tanner Center here at Southern Utah University. I'll give you just a little background about the Grace A. Tanner Center and then introduce our guest, Marie Inahosa. The Grace A. Tanner Center for Human Values was created through an endowment provided by the Tanner Trust for, for Utah Universities by Obert C. Tanner, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of Utah, and the founder and former chairman of the O.C. Tanner Jewelry Company. The purpose of the trust was to provide for a lecture series at three Utah universities to which the Tanner family had close ties, the University of Utah, Utah State University, and Southern Utah University, then Southern, State Southern Utah State College, where Grace Adams Tanner, Obert's beloved wife, had attended school. At, the Southern, at Southern Utah University, the Tanner Lecture was established as a function of the Grace A. Tanner Center. Obert C. Tanner was an educator, industrialist, and philosopher or philanthropist. Of all the gifts he has left to the universities, the one he is, was the most proudest was the Lectures on Human Values. The Tanner Lecture on Human Values was form formally established at the University of Cambridge, England, in, on July 1, 1978. In writing about the purpose of these lectures, Professor Tanner said, I see them simply as a search for a better understanding of human behavior and human values. To this end, the lecture provides a forum in which to promote scholarly and scientific learning in the field of human values while embracing moral, artistic, intellectual, and spiritual values, both individual and social, and advancing the full register of values permanent to the human condition, interest, behavior, and aspiration. We share the honor of hosting this lecture with uh, such places as Stanford University, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and other prestigious uh, universities. This year, the Tanner Center is exploring the theme, of a, the theme presented by a TED Talk by Chimamanda Adichie of the danger of a single story. Adichie argues that we can dispel stereotypes through the sharing of our stories. And so we're going to be exploring that concept throughout the year of how we share stories to give us insight to the human condition. Maria Inahosa has reported hundreds of important stories from the, from the restrictive immigration policies in Fremont, Nebraska, to the effects of the oil boom in North Dakota, to the stories of the poor in Alabama. As a reporter for NPR, Inahosa was among the first to report on youth violence in urban communities on a national scale. During her eight years as CNN's urban affairs correspondent, Inahosa often took viewers into communities rarely shown on television. Now on, uh, on America by the Numbers, Inohosa continues to bring attention to communities and issues usually ignored. In the nearly 30 years as a journalist, she has worked for CNN, PBS, CBS, WNBC, and WGBH. Her previous projects include PBS's Need to Know series and the WGBH LA uh, Plaza Talk show, sorry, La Plaza Talk show, Marie Inohosa, one-on-one. -on -one. Inahosa has received numerous awards for her work, including four Emmys, the 2012 John Chan Chancellor Award for Excellence in Journalism, Robert F. Kennedy Award for Reporting on the Disadvantaged, the Studs Terkel Community, Community Media Award, the Edward R. Murrow Award for the Overseas Press Club for Best Documentary for her groundbreaking Child Brides, Stolen Lives. We had the pleasure last night of having a small gathering with students to discuss different topics with Maria Inahosa. This afternoon at 2.30, there will be an extended Q&A, a discussion on, um, on uh, documenting truth and social media in the Student Center Theater. So if you'd like to extend this today's uh, conversation, then please uh, attend that 2.30 in the, in the um, Student Center Social Media, or sorry, Student Center Theater. Marie Inahosa's career has illuminated stories by populations that are often ignored by mainstream media. In these contemporary times, as our country is experiencing what I would consider to be various split identities, Inohosa's sharp eye and acute listening ear serves us well. By shedding light on the untold stories of America, she dismantles stereotypes and reminds us of the poignancy and strength of the human condition. Please welcome Maria Inohosa. everyone. Um, okay. Now you can. You're working on that. All right. But that, okay, good, because, you know, sometimes you get these um, podiums, and I'm, as we say in Mexican Spanish, I'm a chaparra, which means I'm a shorty. 
Um, so sometimes you can never see me, so I'm glad that you can see me. That's important. I can't see you, but I will in a little bit when we um, maybe raise the lights a little bit just so that I can. But this is great. I saw this hall, and it really is a great hall. I'm kind of like, what am I doing here <laughs> in this hall? Um, so I, I really want to thank you so deeply um, to the Tanner Center, to Danielle, to, to your entire university community, to Cedar City. Um, I mean, this is really powerful for me, actually. <clears throat> it's, um, <clears throat> I kind of wish that I could let each and every one of you kind of into, as I was writing this, I was like, my heart is exploding. You know, I feel all of this gushing and love and joy about the fact that you guys have chosen me to be your speaker for the Tanner Lecture. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it doesn't take much to move me to tears these days. Um, I don't know, and that's okay. Crying is all right. Um, but you know, you're probably asking yourself, like, why is this prominent Mexican-born, Chicago-raised, and now American citizen journalist on the verge of tears because she's here visiting you in Cedar City, southern Utah, for the very first time in her life? Because, see, this decision of yours to invite me, your decision that you want to hear from me at this particular moment in our country's history, it's deep. And it's precisely why I don't lose hope for our country, for my country. It's because of you that today I love our country more. It's because of your decision at this moment to say, hey, I want to listen. I mean, because come on, I don't, again, I'm, I'm looking at the audience, but I'm imagining that for the majority of us, right, um, you know, you're, we couldn't be more different than each other. I was born in Mexico City. Um, by the time I came along, I was the youngest of four. My dad had essentially perfected his profession. He was the first in his family to go to college and to medical school. He was raised in the small city of Tampico in Mexico. And he knew his dream. His passion was to become um, a medical investigator. He wanted to do scientific research, but he knew he wanted to become a medical doctor before he even dedicated himself to research. And then he found his passion was the inner ear and understanding deafness. So <clears throat> the truth is, is that mi papa, Dr. Raul Hinojosa, was not really interested in leaving his country. Like most people around the world, actually, he didn't want to migrate. And the truth is, he wasn't really so keen on coming to El Norte. And for him, the United States presented something of a quandary because he respected the country, right? But the freedom, this independence, this constant questioning, which is at the essence of our vibrant democracy, dad kind of worried about too much freedom here and the abuse of that freedom. So I remember dad saying things to me like, you know, existe la libertad, pero existe el libertinaje, which is, there's liberty, there's freedom, but there's also like, you know, libertinaje, which means you take, a, you take advantage of that freedom. Okay, truth be told, he was uh, often talking about that in terms of um, male-female relationships, if you know what I mean. Okay, maybe you're like, what is she talking about? You'll talk about that later. Um, so unlike many of you who didn't have to make the decision about moving to a new country, for my family, that was kind of the core of our existence, and also because we kept on going back from Chicago to Mexico every year. So in some ways, again, you and I couldn't be more different. And yet, you want to know my story, and you know that along the way, you're probably going to come to identify with me in some element. In some way, you're, you're actually going to end up seeing if you can see yourself in me, perhaps the person most unlike you. And this is who we are in many ways as a people. We are a people in a country that is filled with curiosity and, yes, openness. And you, Cedar City, you, Southern Utah University, you are a place of creative, curious openness. I mean, that's what I've seen. And a little bit later, I'll tell you more deeply about what I've seen and felt in the almost one full day that I've been here. <laughs> Fresh eyes are always great, though, so, so I think you'll appreciate. But the truth is, is that we also know 
that there is an uglier part of who we are in this country, right? So getting back to my dad, you know, my dad, um, when he developed Alzheimer's and we were kind of, you know, packing stuff up, I, there was a letter that he had, we uncovered that he had written to my mom. Um, and, ooh, there you go. Sorry, Mike had fallen down there a little bit. Um, so my dad had written this, uh, written my mom a long letter based on the very first trip that he made by bus from Tampico to Chicago uh, in the early 1950s. So as soon as uh, the bus crossed into the United States, into Texas, they made a pit stop, and my dad had to make this decision. Right? It was a decision that he had never had to make in Mexico. And it really was kind of, again, kind of the clarity of what the El Norte, the United States, represented for him, which was freedom on the one hand, an abuse of freedom, and also some other things. Because you know, in that first pit stop, he had to confront race and racism. And that was pretty much foreign to my dad, who was born and raised in Mexico. Because it was at that Texas pit stop that my dad had to decide, was he colored or was he white? And this was what my dad didn't like about the United States, that on the one hand, there was too much freedom. And on the other hand, there was the denial of freedom. And if you weren't white, that denial was, in fact, everywhere and institutionalized. It's as if my father understood the crux of the fault lines in this country that he had to choose. Was he white or not? And even though dad was brown, he was white enough to pass. And so he sided with racial privilege. And this was confusing because dad had his doubts about this country. And, you know, my dad became an American citizen almost immediately. And so he was laughed at by his family in Mexico and teased for being an American citizen. Now, for my mom, Berta Hinojosa, there was a different situation. She was very open. She was very open to change. She loved adventure. She was young. She got married to my dad when she was 17. What? Um, yes. Um, but she was really happy to challenge the norms. And she had grown up going to an American school, so she spoke English. Um, but in some ways, my dad carried the wound of never really feeling a part of this country. My mom was the one who was prepared to embrace all of the independence and the questioning. It's as if my mom knew and, in fact, internalized what she believed American democracy to be all about. It's almost as if she, be, she came prepared to embody the First Amendment from the first day that she arrived. Now, when I was much older, I finally found out my arrival story, and I encourage you to Find out what is your arrival story. How did you get to where you got? Because we all know we came from someplace, right? Because, of course, we're standing on the land of the indigenous peoples of the Paiute and others. So we all came from someplace, right? So find out that narrative of your own family, your own ancestral arrival story. But the story goes that, um, uh, that my mom was flying... So my dad was in the, at the University of Chicago. He had already been there for six months. And um, mom was coming with the four kids. So I don't know, there's this like image of my mother getting on a plane with four kids under the age of seven. I was a toddler in her arms. She's dressed up because, you know, that's what you did in the 1950s or 60s when you flew. And so she had on, you know, kitten heels and a petticoat dress. And she was just all fabulous and gorgeous with four kids screaming on a plane. Um, and we landed in Dallas, Texas to change planes, do immigration, and then move, to, uh, move on to our flight to Chicago. So if there's anybody here who, has, uh, who is from Texas, please excuse me. I am going to imitate a Texas accent. Just excuse me for a little bit. But in the way that I talk, I, when I learned this story, it was I really did come to understand, like, Mom, Mom took this, this um, First Amendment thing really seriously. And also that... You know, as women in particular, we're really good at silencing our inner voice. We're really good at, like, you know, pushing down that intuitive gut. And this story, to me, symbolized what happens actually and what I learned from the power that my own mother had when she trusted her gut. Because what happened was when they got to the immigration checkpoint at the airport, um, tall, tall Texan immigration agent um, looks at all the paperwork, and we all had green cards, 
And he says, well, now, ma'am, I do see. I do see that everything is in order for you here. I see all the paperwork. You are all legally allowed to be coming into the United States of America. Congratulations on that. There is only one problem, ma'am. Uh, you will have to be leaving the baby, me. You're going to have to leave her here for quarantine. She's got a strange rash, and we don't want her bringing any strange illnesses into the United States of America. So you are free to go to Chicago. Just leave the baby, ma'am, and uh, we'll see you soon. And, and you know, that thing, right, that mother thing, that woman thing, that First Amendment thing, that freedom of speech thing, that I don't know, democracy means you challenge. And my mom kind of found this voice that came up from her inner, and she didn't quite grab his bicep, but it's as if she did, something that I do not recommend doing to any immigration agent at all, um, especially not now. And she just looked at him, and she was like, sir, my name is Berta Hinojosa, and I have legal paperwork for all four of my children plus myself. And I, have a, I can tell you now that you can call the president of the University of Chicago and you can ask to speak to the president of the University of Chicago because he is the person who employed my husband, Dr. Raul Hinojosa, who is a medical doctor and a researcher, and we will all be going to Chicago, all four of us. Do you understand, sir? He said, yes, I do, ma'am. Come on in. <laughs> So, you know, again, I didn't know that story until much later, but I kind of, you know, I kind of love that because mom learned there, like there was something that she may, might not have done in Mexico, but this was her new country and she stood believing in her right to challenge. And thankfully, because I don't know, then I might have just stayed in the Dallas airport forever. Um, which would have not been good. Now, um, this is the power of narrative, right? I just made you laugh. I made you feel something. Suddenly you feel a little bit closer to me. You feel like you understand me a little bit better as a fellow American, right? And I am proud of this story, far from ashamed. And, you know, this is not a Latino story. This is not a Mexican story. This is my American story. But our American history is colored with silenced stories, with shame and judgment and power over who gets to tell their story, when, how, and why. So again, that's why it's so deeply emotional for me to be here in Cedar City at Southern University, Southern Utah University today, because you want to listen. And right now in our country, there is, there is a shortage of being able to listen, right? And there is a shame around certain American stories. Right now, before our very eyes, before your very eyes, there is a culture of silence among our fellow Americans. And when I mean fellow Americans, I mean that broadly. People who have the legal right to be here, and maybe Americans who have been here their whole lives, but who have no paper to be here. To say things now, to somehow challenge the official narrative of our history, sometimes now it's being seen as disrespectful. But you know, that is what we do in the United States of America. We criticize, we critique, but it doesn't bring me any joy to say that factually, we in fact know who the very first undocumented immigrants on this land were. The land of the Paiute, the Navajo, the Lenape, the Kickapoo, the Cherokee, the Sioux, the, the Tohono O'odham, it was, in fact, the pilgrims, right? They came without right. They claimed this land in a sometimes friendly, but often not kind of way. It was violent. It was racist. It was white supremacy. It was sexist. It was abusive. It was a genocide of Native peoples through murder or death by illness. It was also collaboration, love affairs, chemistry, new American families, and the new American reality. But, of course, it's going to hurt you. It's going to make you shudder. It's going to make you squirm when I say to you that those pilgrims were, in fact, the first illegal aliens on this land. Right? Who wants to be called that term? But is it the truth? Maybe it's among the great truths that we have to look at, right? Is owning this, this confrontation and this collaboration between pilgrim and indigenous. So yes, of course it's scary when people are talking about, well, we've got to get rid of Columbus Day and just, you know, all of that has got to change. But we just did an In the Thick, which is my politics podcast, right? And 
one of our indigenous um, members from uh, California was speaking, and she just said, you know, Columbus spone, spoke with disdain and hatred towards anyone who wasn't white. So it's a painful question. Should we be celebrating a man who carried this in his heart? It is painful. It is scary. It is uncomfortable. It is challenging, just like life is. What we have in our country, though, is this vibrant culture of critique and of criticism, and in fact, of our historic and patriotic duty to always question, which is, in fact, why one of my favorite thoughts about patriotism comes from a character who is imminently and could only exist in the United States of America. Because it could only be in our country that you could be a man born into slavery, be an enslaved child, Frederick Douglass, then become freed, then travel the world, then publish your own American newspaper, the North Star. And you choose, as Frederick Douglass did, to live in the country that once enslaved you, but that also fought for your freedom and then empowered you as an equal. And that man, Frederick Douglass, who looks nothing like me, taught me the essence of patriotism, which is, loosely, paraphr loosely paraphrasing, that those of us who love our country the most cannot be afraid of criticizing. You know, that sometimes painful criticism comes from love and comes from knowing that we have to do better, because we must. Because the formerly silenced the formerly silenced indigenous, the formerly enslaved, the formerly arrested and jailed Americans of Japanese descent, and the currently targeted undocumented immigrants who in some cases are the most American of all of us, these too are our American stories. Some are beautiful, some are painful. So my work as an American journalist right now <clears throat> is to add what I call mi granito de arena, my little grain of salt to the history of our country by helping to tell these stories. Look, I used to have shame and silence, right? I used to wish all the time when I was little that why was my name Maria de Lourdes Hinojosa Ojeda? Ugh. Why couldn't I just be Lisa or Randy? Why did my parents have to speak with that accent? Why didn't I have blonde straight hair? Why didn't I have relatives who were pilgrims? Why couldn't I be white? Now, there's a saying in Spanish, no hay mal que por bien no venga. There is no bad from which good cannot come. And I really love, really, really love that saying. And there is a lot of bad that's going on out there in the world, all over. So I, I, I feel it. I also want to acknowledge the fear. Um, and I acknowledge that fear of change can be really challenging for all of us, for many of us. So your invitation, once again, is to me part of this continuum of the conversation of our democracy, to be willing to take on the bad and find the good in it. For example, truthfully, with a broken heart, I have to tell you I'm still not over Charlottesville. I'm just not. I'm not over the chanting about white men being replaced by Jews or by immigrants or by women. They feel so much hate. What they don't understand is like, we just want to be friends. We just want to fall in love. We just want to see ourselves in you, not replace you, become a part of you because we already are. You just don't see it, right? We just want to be with you together see you as equals, not replace you. But our entire country, right, was shocked when we saw what happened there, seeing all of that in full display. This can't be who we are, right? This isn't who we are. Or is it? You know, why, why is it that it causes us pain to have to look at this part of who we are? Because... I'm one of those people, I'm one of those journalists, I think because um, I'm also a mother and I'm an American citizen and I have American citizen kids that I'm just like, that's not who we are. We're not that anymore. And then, you know, younger, 
That's why we love the millennials, because they're like, no, no, no. They start criticizing and tearing you down. We all know that. Those of you who are not millennials know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I started doing a, a look inside my own experience, and I realized I went back to this story of what happened when I was six years old, six or seven, and a guy by the name of George Wallace was running for president. And I knew just from hearing, and there was no Twitter, Facebook, there was black and white television, and the news was on in the evenings, period. But I knew that this man, George Wallace, did not like me. And my best friend was Jewish, Linda, Linda Kahn. And I remember walking home one day um, and with Linda, and we were talking about, very seriously, whose basement we were going to hide in if George Wallace became president. Because we knew he did not like Jewish people, and we knew he did not like Mexicans. And so Charlottesville made me think back on that, like, well, wait a second. This has been around. I've even felt it. It's almost as if it's a part of who we are, right? And yet we have a hard time discussing it. And I'm sure that right now, as you're hearing this, you might feel a little sad about the fact that me, as a little Mexican-American girl with a green card, hold on, let me take off my, let me take off my hoop so it doesn't bother the microphone. Okay. Um, I, I know that you, you know, you're connecting with me through this story that narrative. There's an emotional connection that you have about that little girl. And that's why I love to tell stories. So when I was growing up in Chicago, my family consumed the news media voraciously. Time Magazine, 60 Minutes, Meet the Press, The Evening News. But I never saw myself there. So I never thought that my stories had value or that I had value. I remember standing up right next to the television set by now, it was a color television set, so it was like early 1970s, and we splurged to get one. I remember standing right next to the television set and watching someone by the name of Dan Rather um, reporting on the Vietnam War. And even though I, 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 I loved seeing the news, I was always wondering why I wasn't there or anyone who looked like me. Guess who I was sitting with just a couple of days with? Eye to eye, face to face, having an equal conversation as American journalists. That guy, Dan Rather, who now has a show on Sirius XM Radio. I don't know how old Dan Rather is. He's a little old. Er. Um, but you know what? He's at it every day. He was one of our chief news anchors. And now he's inviting me to have a conversation with him about who we are. This man who I used to you know, just see through the television screen, and now we are equals. That's what we're talking about, not replacing, but becoming your equal and being able to look into each other's eyes and have this conversation as equals. And Mr. Rather was asking me, actually, on his Sirius XM radio show, to communicate to his mostly Anglo audience, who might be a little bit afraid of the ch changes that are going on right now. So he asked me, he said, what would you say? What would you say to them? And I said, well, you know, with love and respect, I would ask a central question. What exactly are you afraid of? I mean, this country was multi culty way before the pilgrims even stepped foot on this country, uh, on this land, right? We had multiple tribes who were living, finding ways to live together. Um, so that was already happening here. But you know, much of the narrative right now told by the mainstream media is that we, the other, are somehow seen as the, you know, this agent of change, but that it's an agent of change that is here to take over, to take away, to take something from you, and that this demographic change must be looked at with a sense of dread or loss or of concern. And this is why owning my narrative, owning my voice, and owning my power is so essential. Because you see, the mainstream media has historically struggled with being inclusive and representative. In fact, since September 11th, 16 years ago, our newsrooms have actually gotten less diverse, right? At a time, bless you, at a time when demographic change is booming, 
we have actually fewer voices of diverse backgrounds reporting and telling this epic story of change. So it's no surprise that the tenor of the reporting on this demographic change, if it's coming from non-diverse newsrooms, then somehow this change is looked at as something worrisome, kind of like, oh my god, what is happening? What is all of this change about? As opposed to, whoa, isn't this fascinating, right? So I'm not surprised that a candidate and a president who is playing on that kind of fear of change wins the election, which is why I end up creating my own nonprofit media company, the Futuro Media Group. Because while I love and respect our great American newsmen, like Edward R. Murrow, Dan Rather, Walter Cronkite, John Chancellor, Studs Terkel, all those guys that I've won awards named after, which is like a total honor, but they know that I could never see the world through their eyes, right? But I'm just as an American journalist as they are. And I didn't know this when I created my own nonprofit company, that it turns out I am the only Latina woman running a nonprofit media company in the United States of America that is telling stories from what we call a POC perspective, a people of color perspective. Mind you, our audience for Latino USA, our radio show distributed by NPR, just grew by 45% over the last year. And the majority of our audience is not Latino. So there is an interest, there is a hunger on the part of our country to understand who we are, a curiosity. But let me tell you why, for example, an example of, of why, how somebody who approaches this diversity um, approaches stories differently. So. When I'm asked to go to the heartland, for example, you know, um, and I go into Iowa or Nebraska or Minnesota or Ohio, I see, I see those parts of the country that are imminently diverse, like right here. So the story goes, right, that I um, arrived to this beautiful bed and breakfast not too far from here, and there's construction going on, right? And the gentleman who owns the bed and breakfast is like, sorry about the construction, it's really noisy but they'll be done by three o'clock. I was like, okay, sure. I live in New York City, noise, no problem, seriously. Um, 5.30, they were still working. 5.30 p.m., they were still working last night. At seven o'clock this morning, that's when the first beeping started. So that is who you are right here in Cedar City. That is our America, that kind of diversity, right? I don't have to go far to find it. So for example, when I travel to the interior of Minnesota, I, a journalist with this perspective, I find in this small town in the middle of nowhere, Minnesota, a town with Anglo-Americans, Somali American citizens, and Latino immigrants all figuring it out together. And I run into a little Mexican store that has like food products and cowboy hats and cowboy boots for the Latinos in that same store Right next to the First Communion dresses and the Quinceañera dresses, there were prayer rugs for her Somali Muslim neighbors, right? That is the heartland that I see when I travel in our country. In Iowa, I see the Latinos who feel imminently Iowan. I meet Latino Nebraskans, Latino Southerners, Latino Alaskans, and you know, Latino Utahans? Thank you. So I want to share a story with you about why it's important for you to open your eyes, right? That, um, that sometimes the narrative that we're being told, right, that has their own interest, goes counter what we actually are seeing. So I was in Omaha, and I love Nebraska. But I love the heartland. I just, my staff is like, what? Because um, they're not, you know, they're not traveling as much, but I love getting out, right? So I'm in Omaha, I'm in a lift, and the guy who picks me up, he's probably like, you know, 55 or so, white guy. And um, as usual, you know, I'm like, hey, can I ask you a question? Because I'm a journalist and I do this. I was like, he was like, sure. I said, so who'd you vote for? He was like, oh, I voted for Trump. And I was like, cool. So why? He was like, well, I really like the way he talks. I was like, okay, cool. But give me like a specific, like what do you like about his policies? He was like, well, I really like that wall. I really like the wall. Uh, because I really want them to keep out all those drug dealers and the gangbangers. And I said, okay, 
uh, I said, but you know, you're, you're in Omaha and there's a large Latino population right here, right? Yeah. I said, so do you see those gangbangers and drug dealers right here in Omaha? He was like, no. I said, oh. He was kind of like, you got me. I was like, well, no, I'm just asking. And he said, well, OK. I said, but all right, what, something else that you like about Donald Trump? He said, well, I like that Muslim ban. Because I don't really want those terrorists, those Muslim terrorists in my community. I said, OK, cool. Well, we're in Omaha. There's a large Muslim community here, a large refugee community. I see. do you see those terrorists out there? He was like, oh, boy. You got me again. I was like, and then he was the one who actually said, whoa. Because he actually watches Fox and MSNBC. Like, those are his two stations. So he was like, whoa, you know, I can't believe it. I'm actually, wow, I was not actually seeing. I was just believing. And I was like, yeah. And then he says, you know, you're really smart. And as I'm getting out of the car, he says, where are you from? I said, I'm Mexican. <laughs> so that when you're able to see yourself and your community for what it is, not for what you're being told it is. At the same time, I do acknowledge fear. I acknowledge fear of change. Look, I, um, I, I developed PTSD after September 11th. I know what a shock can be. I know what fear feels like, and I don't diminish it, and I don't disrespect people who feel it. Um, and right now, I'm worried to be honest with you, like I'm really afraid of things like the destruction of American democracy, our fall from grace at the top of the international world community. I'm afraid for so many people who feel afraid simply to be who they are. I'm afraid of the havoc that this time is gonna wreak on so many lives that will be upended. I'm afraid to see how ugly we can become when fear and hate are what moves us. But I choose not to live in fear. Yes, this also comes from being older, but I try to give it to the youngers, right? To the younguns, which is that I choose right now compassion, respect, understanding, engagement, love, humanity, democracy. I choose seeing myself in the person most unlike me as a daily, hourly task as a patriotic American. This is my job as a journalist, to understand and report, but not to judge. This is my job as an American committed to democracy. Not too long ago, black journalists who reported, so you know there have been black journalists in our country, um, they had newspapers, um, but when black journalists in our country wanted to report about lynchings that were happening, and in the newsrooms, white journalists would say, that's, that, that's not news, that's just another lynching, right? And the black journalists were documenting this, and what, how were they seen? They were seen as unpatriotic, they were seen as journalists who had an agenda, right? So um, what do we call, what have we learned to call this thing where they were actually arresting innocent Americans who happened to be of Japanese descent and putting, it, putting them into an internment camp? It wasn't an internment camp, it was imprisonment. This is why the first massive deportation of Mexicans and of American citizens of Mexican descent in the early 1930s in this precise area of the country, in the Southwest, was called the Great Repatriation. It wasn't great, and it wasn't a repatriation. It was a forced mass exodus and expulsion of people based on their ethnicity, and that happened in our country before. It is time to look at who we are. And you chose to listen. You chose to listen with respect and an open heart. And for that, my fellow Americans, I respect you. So what did I do? My little granito de arena in this continuum of understanding my role as a journalist of color who can help impact the narrative as I see it. Um, I created my own newsroom. Please come and visit. It's a hop, skip, and a jump and about five airplanes, no, just, just kidding. Um, please come and visit. Um, if you have a place to live, apply for an internship at our company. I mean that very seriously. Um, the newsroom that I have is probably the most diverse newsroom you'll ever see. 
Uh, we have Latinos of every background, Mexican, Argentinian, Co Costa Rican, Peruano. We have African American from the South. We have Jewish from Queens, um, Asian, Ch Chinese American from California, and even formerly Orthodox Jewish and formerly Muslim. All of that in my newsroom. And so we are committed to telling the story. Sometimes those stories may seem light, like our most recent edition called The Hidden History of Latinos in Rock and Roll, because how many of you knew that David Bowie's guitarist was Puerto Rican and killing it as a guitarist? Um, you know, sometimes we report on the celebration of the Tucson Rodeo, whose official name is La Fiesta de los Vaqueros. It's 100 years old in Tucson. Um, sometimes we report on the celebration of the quinceañera, and it turns out that actually the quinceañera can be seen as a form of brown girl resistance, where for one day the entire community just loves you, right? This is our Latino USA. I hope you listen, I hope you subscribe, because our audience grew by 45% last year. So we, we are, our part in the American story of journalism is to say, um, see who we are, don't be afraid. Okay, I'm seeing the time. Uh, I have 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, and we have time for, for a little bit of question and answers here up, up on stage. So what does it look like when you can make the decisions about the stories that you're going to cover? What does it look like when you can make decisions about what words you use in your newsroom? So you will never hear the word minority coming out of my mouth in my reporting. I don't see myself as a minority. I think that um, the term minority is when we really have to get rethink because Anglo-America is becoming a numerical minority, but that word signifies isolation, um, disenfranchisement, disempowerment. So do we really want to be using that word? And plus, I've never looked at my kids and said, you're a member of a minority group. I just have never done that. So you won't hear that word in my newsroom. And you won't hear the word illegal in reference to a human being. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the moment when I went viral. By the way, once you go viral, you wake up the next day, nothing changes. Um, but I did have a moment where um, I corrected um, a, a Trump um, surrogate. His name is Steve Cortez, and we are now friends. After I had this moment with him, we became friends, um, where I told him illegal. He was talking about the illegals who were going to do the, something, or the illegals who were standing out there on the corner, or the illegals, this, and I just said, there's no such thing as um, an illegal human being, and illegal is not a noun, okay? It's not a noun. <laughs> and, um, and I said, you know who I learned that from was actually Elie Wiesel, who survived the Holocaust. Not a radical Latino, Latina studies professor, but Elie Wiesel who said the first thing that the Nazis did was they declared the Jews to be an illegal people. So, those are things that I'm able to do because of the newsroom that I run, right? And because of the newsroom that we run, we make decisions about telling a story, not just about rock and roll, but actually the story of one Mexican immigrant who crosses the border to be reunited with his children in Las Vegas, who ends up giving himself over to the border patrol, and three days later, he is dead in his cell while he is on suicide watch, he commits suicide by swallowing his sock. Yes, it's horrible. I didn't believe it. That's why I wanted to do this story. I said, there's, there's this, there was foul play here. No human being can swallow their sock. He did. We just won the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award for the reporting that we did there. No one else has told the story, the strange death of Jose de Jesus. We did. There are no legally binding standards for the immigration detention centers, the immigration detention camps that exist all across our country that have a profit, profit motive. As you know, the, uh, the fastest growing part of the private prison industrial complex are immigration detention camps. These are places that will be looked at. They will probably be kept as historical relics of a period of time when our fellow citizens 25, 30 years from now will say, what were you doing? You were putting children and women and refugees 
And people who have committed no crime except for being in the country without papers, you are holding them? You are putting them into rooms that everybody, all of those immigrants called yeleras, ice boxes? That's how we treat people coming to our country? That we don't feed them? Because there are no legally binding standards, actually, for those privately run detention centers to determine how much food you're going to get? The notion that right now, how much due process you can deny to a people is being tested on the backs of people whose only difference between you and them is that they, like me, were not born in this country. This is who we are. And this is part of the reason why I'm able to tell the stories that I tell, right? Because I took the control of telling, of creating my own company and telling these narratives. So, all right, let me get to the last part because I actually just wrote this last night. Um, because I, I left some space in my speech to, to reflect back to you, you know? Oftentimes people are saying, what should we do? What should we do? What should we do? And I'm like, you guys need to know that you got it, right? You already got it. You need to own your own power and your own narrative. So last night, um, one of the students, it was this fascinating conversation. Um, and we were talking about diversity and change. And basically, um, one of the tables was mostly students of color. The other one was not. And, um, and the students of color, one of the students was a, a Latina from Compton. Um, a predominantly black and Latino community in Southern California. And she talked about getting here and feeling completely out of place because suddenly there were no people of color around, right? But who was, you know, who was she able to talk about that shock with? There was another young man who grew up on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona, and I love this because he was like, look, in my community, I'm the majority. And people come to my community and they go into culture shock because they've never been on a reservation. But all of a sudden, when he left the reservation and came here, he experienced that culture shock, right? Um, another one of the students um, told me about this experience, um, because she is the daughter of undocumented immigrants, about this desire to want to do something and the questioning that we have and the sometimes the fact that we silence ourselves and say, no, I could never do that. And the fact that she did, she put her foot forward and said, I'm going to create something out of nothing, this alchemy of what democracy can be. And in fact, that is who we are, right? That is who you have to be. That is who Cedar City is already. It is, in fact, these young people who are creating, who are questioning, who are curious, who are humble, who, have, who are want to approach this change with respect and curiosity. So Martin Luther King Jr., the man who affected me the most in my life, you know, he had this dream. He did not have a five-year strategic plan, okay? That was a joke. You can laugh. In other words, this is a moment when what democracy looks like is that young woman who decided, I'm going to create this moment on this campus and see what happens. And to everybody's surprise, people showed up. So this is a moment when you need to take control of your power and your narrative. This is a time when I'm not here to tell you what to do, but to reflect back on you so that you can see actually that right here in Cedar City, you are experiencing diversity, inclusion, intersectionality, the confrontation of multiculturalism in all of its beauty and complexity. You're living it. Where did I go get my food yesterday as soon as I got here? Take a guess. Somebody saw it. What did I eat yesterday as soon as I got to Cedar City? <laughs> the pupusas from the Guatemalan place, OK? And everybody on my social media was like, wait a second, she's Guatemalan? Why is she serving you pupusas? You know, because pupusas are Salvadoran. So it became a whole thread of like, were there tacos there too? Because she's what? And it's like, yeah, in Cedar City, that's how you play. Guatemalan is serving pupusas and tacos. That's how you play. So for me, I just want to say to you, realize the beauty of the place that you are and that like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, another one of my heroes said, um, there is nothing to fear. There is absolutely nothing to fear. So let me calm you by telling you a story of who I am so that you can see that you're already me. Thank you very much.
much. That was such an uplifting story, set of stories about your own life. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Liz Olson. I'm a professor of anthropology here. And this is just such a great honor and privilege for us to have you here. Thank you. It's my, I told you I loved you guys. I'm serious. Well, it's, it's mutual. So um, I have, we have time for, for some questions. And as you were speaking, one of the things that occurred to me, we have a room that's really full of students. And I was thinking, well, what are the students wondering? Because the work you do is so fascinating. I think that being a journalist, and we've seen you on TV, and we've heard you on the radio, and it's like, wow, how did you do it? Um, and as faculty, too, we wonder a lot, how do we get our students to connect the assignments and the work that we give them in the classroom to what's happening in the real world, to becoming really engaged, not just in our community, that's important, but also engaged globally? because a lot of our students do find opportunities to travel and get to know other parts of the world. And I was thinking about the amount of research that you must do for the stories that you cover, and how do you feel that connection between scholarship and research and journalism? Um, I love being on the ground. So for me, um, uh, well, I, don't, I try to not feel bad about most things now, um, in terms of just like not fe feeling guilty, but you know, I'm not necessarily, scanning through all of the Twitter feeds of all of the news and feeling like I have to stay completely on top of everything that's coming out, of course, unless I'm going to be on television, because part of what I'm doing is I'm doing actual on-the-ground reporting, right? So this week I'm here. Last week I was in Oregon. Um, you know, the week before I was in New Haven. Um, before that, I mean, if I give you the list, it's a little dizzying. But I'm always out. And so I think that my, my gut reporting is that um, I feel really positive about who we are and the level of engagement um, and that we need to increase the level of engagement. Um, and in the meanwhile, I have a team, right? I have 20 staff people who are working consistently on turning out stories. So we have a producer who just got back from Puerto Rico. We're doing an hour-long special. We'll be going to Puerto Rico the first week of, um, of December. Um, I just got back from Medellin, Colombia. And I know you're, you're like, Medellin, wait, that's where Pablo Escobar is from. Um, um, and, you know, Medellin, Colombia, that 30 years ago was a war zone, is now one of the most hopeful. It's, it's been uh, voted the most innovative city in the world. So um, I see, just because of my reporting on the ground, a tremendous amount of hope. Um, and that couples with the deep research that we do in terms of our journalism. Um, but we, we put them together. And I guess academically, you know, I'm a professor because I'm Mexican, so I can't say no to work. And I was offered a job as a professor. And I was like, yes. So I'm a professor at DePaul University. So what I do in terms of bringing it into the classroom is a lot of the work that we do with the students is their personal narrative in the classroom and talking about things that oftentimes are not discussed in other places in the campus. That's great. And we've been talking about narrative in a lot of the classes that I know are here today as well with us. So how do we give legitimacy? Because um, narratives, as you pointed out, they're so emotional, and they make us humans and people. And on that level, we can connect. So how do we, how do we give legitimacy to voices, whether they're undocumented, right? these undocumented voices that, because of a political status, become unheard, unseen? How do we give that legitimacy? And what do we gain when we do that? What do we have to win? Well, do you mean, because um, you know we. We put them, for example, we put many of those stories on the air, but let me bring it back to just like, like people. Um, so for example, uh, one of the things that I would do in my own um, home with my kids when they were younger is that when, because in New York you order dinner, right? You don't make it, you pick up the phone. Um, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so when I would order food, right, and the person who would be delivering the food is a Mexican guy. And I would say, oh, ¿qué pasó? ¿Qué onda? So, how are you? Where are you from? Okay, so how long you've been here? What, and what languages do you speak? Oh, oh, you speak Nahuatl, Zapotec, Mixtec, and English and Spanish, and a little bit of Korean? And I'd pull my kids over, and I'd say, like, hey, kids, you know, you're half Mexican. You're related to this guy through your indigenous relationship. And look at him. Here he is in New York City, and he speaks languages that existed before English. So sometimes the narrative can just be actually seeing somebody, having a conversation, asking questions. Yesterday at the Guatemalan restaurant, you know, I took a second and I was just looked over and asked her, so 
when did you get here? You know, what's up? How do you know? Do you like it? She loves it here. Feels incredibly safe here, which is, again, a boon to Cedar City. Um, she feels loved and supported, and she's making good food as a result. Um, so sometimes the narrative is big, like what we're doing, which is creating humanity, just complexity um, about who these people are, because they're Americans just like the rest of us, except for a paper. But in other ways, all of you have the capacity to also share and recognize other people's narrative just in your kind of daily. Um, maybe could we talk also about being a woman and being an investigative journalist and being a woman and, and a Latina woman? And ha have you had any experiences where that's um, where your identity has, has felt like it was maybe under undervalued or something and where you needed, I think you gave us some examples, but I'm sure that there are people here who would like to hear more about how women, as a woman, you've, you've fought to become a successful businesswoman and journalist and leader. Um, it's called hashtag queen of never giving up um, or queens of never giving up. I mean, I just, <clears throat> I think what happened honestly is that I understood I had extraordinary privilege. I, that's really essentially what happened when I was able to um, get to Barnard and then you know get a job at NPR, uh, the first Latina at NPR. I think I understood like it. There's just no reason for me to sit here and and feel strange and awkward and you know disempowered. No, I was like, this is a time when you're going to raise your hand and you're going to bring those story ideas into the newsroom. Even though most of the time they were looking at me like, I've never heard of that story. I've never heard like that's so weird because because I was new. So in that sense, I just, I, I, the, the sense of responsibility, and that's kind of what I put back on you. I mean, those of you who are here are the absolute success stories, right? As I was saying to the, to the students yesterday, we all have those voices of doubt, right? Even Oprah does. I know she does. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm guessing she does. But um, I mean, there's only one person right now who I think doesn't have any sense of self-doubt, and I, I'll let you guess. But, um, you know, most people have a sense of like, you know, is this right? Am I doing it right? You know, and, um, and, and having that ability to calm that voice um, allows you then to come into your own and to really own your power. And again, I, I, I say what I say about Martin Luther King with much love. It's not like he knew what was, you know, what the next thing. They were planning. They had a team. They were working together. And you're just like him in many ways. Um, he was an ordinary man who became extraordinary. And I'm convinced, as I said to the young people, I was like, which one of you is going to run for president? Like, which one of you around this table, both tables, is going to run for president? Um, yeah, that would be my joy, and why not? Great. Yeah. I'm sure we have lots of future presidents here at SUU. I I'm, think why not? Seriously. I agree. I'll work for you guys. So I know this afternoon you're gonna have, we'll have the extended Q&A and you're going to talk more about um, narrative and social media. But that was something I was wondering about as well. And in, you know, even in the last decade, we've seen a lot of examples around the world of how social media has been a real vehicle for social change. Things like the Arab Spring or, or Yo Soy Número 132, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something like that. It was in Mexico. Um, and using social media as a platform, I think it's something that's, really important for the millennial generation. And how have you seen that? And how the, that voice that comes through, is it you know, perhaps some narrative, but a lot of political advocacy as well in social media? Do you, do you feel like that's something that, that we should? Um, I guess what I want to ask is, is that a positive direction? And, and how do we harness it and, and make sure that it continues in a positive direction? I mean, we're all, we're all experimenting this. We're all living it. None of us have, you know, I mean, I, I was on a panel um, last week with Bob Schieffer um, and um, somebody who is highly critical of um, social media, and he was like, you know, just Facebook should disappear, right? Should, like, it's not, it's not helping right now. Um, on the other hand, you know, we just, those of you who are on social media just went through hashtag me too, um, which was all about women kind of sharing their experiences of, you know, sexual assault. And then you do get a sense of like, wow, there's a real community here. Um, I, I mean, I think it's, and, and again, I just interviewed um, CBS News correspondent David Begno, who has become a god because of his reporting on Puerto Rico, because he's, he's on the ground, but he's used social media to be able to connect with all of the people who weren't able to hear from his family. So when I asked him about what's the most important thing that you've learned from this experience of reporting 
in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. He was like the power of social media, which is not what I was expecting him to say. Um, at the same time, the Arab, Arab Spring would have been nothing if people would have just tweeted about it. Do you know what I'm saying? So um, while I believe in that power, ultimately it is actually this, right? Actually going out, engaging. Uh, this is a really important part of the democratic exper experiment. And there is nothing else that can, um, that can recreate this. So yes to being involved and to um, questioning um, at all points, but at the same time also not just doing it from your phone. Great, and let's, maybe we have time for one more question. And I just thought maybe we could talk about the way that, um, going back to the story of your dad when he arrived in Texas, and he had a choice, and he knew very astutely, your dad was very aware of the choice that he could make um, for privilege, and you've talked about your own position in privilege and how you embrace that. And do you have some advice on how you could encourage others of us to acknowledge privilege and use that as a position from which to help others? That's really interesting. Um, no one's actually asked me that question. Um, I think, again, it, when, you, when you realize that you have privilege, that, that then you have responsibility, then I think that your doubts about, am I doing it right? You know, am I, is this correct? That needs to take the back seat, and the responsibility needs to match the privilege. So, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm asking uncomfortable questions all the time. I'm kind of, I don't have a fear of living in uncomfortable spaces because more often than not, I find, a, I find some kind of commonality, even with the people with whom I disagree with the most, I'll find something. So I'm, I'm not afraid of, of engaging in those conversations. And I, I really do think, especially in a place like Cedar City, um, which is so dynamic, in a place like Utah that, you know, again, carries its own burden. Um, and so I, I always like to break stereotypes. So, you know, when I go back to New York, I'm going to be talking about Cedar City and Southern Utah and hoping to blow people's minds, right? To be just like, well, no, it's like there's this whole other thing that's happening. So um, I forgot the question. How do we use our position? At a so, position? So, so you need to... Calm your fears. You need to realize that the fear that you have about, oh, is this going to be weird, is actually less important than the, than the possibility of what can happen from that conversation, right? Um, and most of the time, you're going to be so surprised. So I'll end with, is that a little doggy? Oh, hi. Hi, I'm acknowledging you. And you can immediately see him like, oh, boy. Um, so I'm going to give a, a short little story about what this looks like. Because again, I, I talk to everyone, right? And I do talk politics, but I talk about politics from a place of curiosity, right? And just trying to understand, right? So um, it was before the election, and um, we, were, uh, we had an abandoned car that we needed to get rid of. And so we had called our local public radio station to come and pick up the car. We were in the country. And this guy arrives with a big truck, 9.30 in the morning on a Sunday. Um, he gets out of the cab of the truck, and he's like, he doesn't have a shirt on, so his belly is exposed. He's like 50-something, you know, he's got a crew cut like this, and mirror wraparound glasses, and blue jeans that were split. So he had them on, but they were split down the front. So I don't, I'm like, why are you even dressed? Okay. <laughs> so he gets out, you know, and he's like loading up our car to be towed away. And my husband comes out, and my husband can see that my curiosity level is, of course, increasing. I'm like, I want to talk, I want to find out more about this guy. You know, like, what's up? He's like from Connecticut, you know, politics, right? And my husband is looking at me like, no, 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 don't ask the question. Don't ask the question until he's got the car on his truck, at least. But I couldn't help myself. You know, the car was still not on the truck, and I kind of sauntered over. I was like, hey, so can I ask you a question? Yeah, a little personal. He was like, sure. I said, so what are you thinking about the politics? You know, this is, again, about two months before the election. And he says, uh, you know, he basically let it be known that he was not going to be voting for Donald Trump. And I was like, oh, OK, well, well, what about your friends? What do they think of him? And he was like, nope, no, my friends, no, no. And then he went on this rant where he said, let me tell you, 
do you want to know whose land we're standing on right now? And he proceeded to name all of the tribes. And then he said, you want to talk about our founding fathers and about being honorable men? They came to this country. They came to this land. They massacred everybody. And then they created the Constitution and named themselves honorable. That, and he just, like, he, like, tore down in a very loving, critical way, right, about the essence of who we are. And... Not that I, I've actually, I don't judge anymore because I never know. That was as surprising as when I got into a car, um, you know, a full year before the um, election, um, and the African American driver in Atlanta told me that he wanted to vote for Donald Trump. You know? So I'm, I'm never surprised, and I just encourage us, all of you, to approach these conversations. With, um, with openness and the curiosity with which you have come here. And I have great faith in Cedar City and great faith in all of you and in Utah and on this campus. So I leave here incredibly optimistic because of you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for that beautiful message.